Okay, I'm just going to say a few words then, um, just to give a, a little bit of background um, and a, a bit of a, a bit of a call to action, um, and then I will hand over to uh, to Denise just shortly. Uh, so you should all now be able to screen, uh, see my screen, hopefully. Yeah, can you hear me? Okay, good. Okay. Um, so yeah, as I say, I'm just going to give you some background on the uh, the LJC then. Um, and the London Java community. For those of you that are joining us for the first time um, or, uh, or, or joining us afterwards, watching us on, on the, the YouTube channel, we are actually, uh, tonight Denise is joining us for our 50th um, online event, uh, which is good, of, of the last, uh, last three months. So, um, so yeah, it's been busy. Um, so anyway, for those that, that, that don't know us, um, the LGC, it's a, it's a well-established, highly active group that we've got here. Um, so some numbers there, we've got uh, over 7,500 members now. Um, we've been uh, running events for, for some time, so 13 years and, and over 600 events now. Um, but what really makes the LJC different from a lot of other communities um, is, is that we really do push this, uh, this fact that the power of community can really push, uh, really achieve more than the, the power of individual. And, and what we mean within that is, is firstly the, the L&D, so learning and development, things like this evening, um, bringing everyone together and, and getting Denise along and, and helping people from the, uh, the community to, to learn from one another uh, with tech. So things like Adopt OpenJDK, Adopt the JSR, these huge initiatives that have come out of the LJC. And more recently with diversity and in inclusion, um, we've got some, some great efforts going on there. We're really trying to, trying to prove that we can really achieve things as a community here. Uh, so as for who I am, my name is Barry Cranford. I'm the, uh, the founder of the, uh, the London Java community. Um, and I, I am the, uh, I'm not a developer myself, I'm a recruiter, um, I run a business called RecWorks. Um, so at RecWorks, we believe that recruitment can be a, a force for good beyond just getting people jobs. Um, so we see our work as sitting somewhere between um, giving back to people that we have worked with in the past and, and paying forward to people that we hope to work with at, at one point in the future. So some examples of what we do, building communities like the LJC, uh, we have other efforts around graduates, CTOs, um, mentoring communities, and, and a lot more. Organizing events like this evening, um, and coming up with all these uh, the new ideas and, and initiatives within them. Uh, so a few things that we've got at the moment uh, that we've just recently started, the aspiring speakers and the, uh, the aspiring CTOs groups. Uh, if you're interested in, in anything, I'll show you all the different ways that you can get involved in just a second. Hit me up on LinkedIn or follow me on Twitter. Um, talk to me afterwards, and we'd be more than happy to help. Um, it's all powered by recruitment, so if anybody's looking to hire, um, then obviously come and find us, or if you're looking for a job, uh, then, then again, come and see me through LinkedIn. So as for my call to action here, so if you wanna do any of these things, and please, please, please reach out to me. So if you're happy to mentor other people, be it students or just people uh, a few, uh, few steps further back in their career journey, if you want to meet a mentor yourself, we can help you do that through the, uh, through the community. Uh, as I say, the, the diversity and inclusion efforts, if, if you want to help with that, um, we definitely need help there at the moment. Teaching others through speaking, um, moving towards becoming a CTO or, or getting more involved in the Java language itself, then please do come and see me afterwards. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand over to Chris Milikian, who is going to introduce Denise for uh, the rest of the session. And, and I hope you have a, a very nice evening. Chris. Great, thanks, Barry. So um, Denise is here to talk to us about why distributing distributed systems so hard. Um, she's currently a soft, senior software engineer at GitHub. Previously, she built enterprise cloud technology and open source tools at Pivotal. She's talked in uh, North America and Europe and in, uh, in uh, big conferences on topics ranging from continuous delivery to functional programming to scaling company culture. Um, she's when she's not coding, she's often doodling. Uh, sketch notes that break down technical concepts into digestible pieces. I'll um, put her website into the um, chat for you uh, later. But um, please make um, Denise welcome for her talk on why distributed systems so hard. So Denise, um, over to you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Barry and Chris. I'm going to flip over to screen sharing. Hopefully this. Okay, awesome. Uh, how's the cropping on that look, look okay? Cool. That looks fine. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, so hi, everyone. Um, as you can tell by my accent, I am not English, nor am I in, <laughs> I'm actually not in the UK right now either. I, I'm, I'm in Toronto. Um, 
So uh, I'm going to be talking to you today about why distributed systems are so hard. This is a talk that I've done at a couple of conferences now. Um, I always change a few pieces of it depending on like what I'm told about the audience of the conference, but uh, I'm not a Java developer. So if you ask me questions in the Q&A about Java, I'm probably not going to be able to answer them. Um, so just a heads up about that. Uh, so we're going to be talking very, very generally about distributed systems today. So I actually want to start by having a brief meta discussion um, about why in the year 2020, uh, when we're all using fancy cloud computing tools, when Amazon and Google have solved these scale problems much, much better than our individual companies will ever need to solve them. Um, when you know, we're using open source orchestration tools like Kubernetes, for example, um, or maybe some hosted products to manage our services. So a lot of people ask me when they you know, hear that I'm doing this talk, like, why should I even bother <laughs> learning about distributed computing in the year 2020? Like, aren't these solved problems? And the answer I have to that is, well, the thing is, even if you are using, you know, layers of orchestration tools and things that uh, solve like the low level problems for us, the reality is that every single person who's writing software today runs a distributed system. Even if you only call yourself an app dev, you got to run that app somewhere. And where that app lives in production is a distributed system of some sort. So the specific tools that we use to build these apps to orchestrate and monitor and scale systems are going to change from year to year. Uh, Technology trends are really fickle, much like my cat's dietary habits. Um, but the fundamental principles for designing and operating services on top of distributed systems haven't changed all that much in the last few decades. And I'm going to be talking through some academic contributions to the field of distributed computing throughout this talk. Uh, and you'll notice that the time, <laughs> the time stamps, the, the publication dates on these papers um, date back to the early 90s and 80s which I think is really cool. We haven't learned that much since then. So the best way to future-proof systems despite these changes in technology is actually to level up a little bit in terms of our understanding of the fundamentals. So also, and something I learned, sorry, I'm having trouble navigating a little bit. It keeps like clicking out of the window. Um, the other thing I would say here is that it's really fun to learn about distributed computing. A lot of people think that this is a field that's really hard or dry or, you know, really technical and academic and it can be all of those things. But once you get the balls rolling and you start talking to more and more people who are excited about this space, it actually is really, really fun and interesting and challenging. So here's a rundown of the high level agenda that we're going to be following today. And as you can tell, I ran this talk at QCon London recently. So that's why the link is denisu.io slash QCon. Um, but we're going to start by talking about why distributed systems are even a thing, uh, why they evolved out of necessity. We're going to have a recap, um, which is going to be a reference to the cap theorem. Don't, don't worry if you don't know what that is yet. We're going to talk about why networks are hard and close off by talking about social technical mitigations and explore a tiny, tiny bit into adaptable and complex systems. And literally, like, I'm only going to scratch the surface on that point. Um, if you have questions on that, we can talk more about that in the Q&A. So, and my slides are already online. They are at denisu.io slash QCon. So if you're someone who prefers to follow slides at your own pace, um, or you want to, I don't know, like live tweet or something, you can get the highest resolution pictures there. So we're going to go through a brief history lesson. Um, a long time ago, in a data center, not too far away, probably somewhere in Northern Virginia, all business applications talked to one database. Typically, uh, business systems look like this. You had a bunch of different clients, a bunch of different applications, and they communicated with one server, literally like a monolithic database, uh, like an Oracle DB instance or something like that. So client server architecture was quite easy to model. Like they generally looked like this. And this worked for a super long time because, well, unfortunately for a long time, IT was a cost center, right? It was a sink, uh, a money sink, uh, something that we needed to do to keep the lights on so that more interesting money-making operations could happen elsewhere in the business. Um, but somewhere in the mid 90s, that stopped being true because technology began to become a competitive advantage uh, somewhere, you know, 20, 30 years ago, which, mean, which meant that we actually had to start taking the IT component a lot more seriously and investing in that. So the core value for many businesses then, and, and it is still today, um, is of course customer data. We as a technology industry have always needed better ways to store and retrieve and process our data. So the way that we store and retrieve data evolved, of course, with this newfound emphasis on the technology itself. Today, for most companies, not all, but I want to say like for most companies, it's usually not sufficient to just have one monolithic database anymore for like all of your production data. 
Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. And the first reason, and this is something that I run into every single day at work, um, you more and more companies are making uh, data analysis driven decisions. Um, product driven companies want to look at what customers are actually doing before they decide what feature to build, how to validate the success of a feature, that sort of thing. So data warehouses are super, super common. You don't want to be hitting your production database with expensive SQL queries like, uh, give me all the transactions where rabbits under the age of 40 bought three or more carrots. Um, that, you know, that, that will lock your production database and uh, potentially like put way too much uh, pressure on something that is like actually business critical. Um, we also have like new and fun <laughs> use cases for data. Like we have machine learning is super popular now, natural language processing, very, very popular. Um, search, uh, I guess like search indexes, search engines um, are becoming a more core part of every single business. I actually learned recently from a friend that um, I, I always thought search was just like you just throw an Elasticsearch instance in there, but <laughs> it's a lot more complicated than that. And you do have to think about like search infrastructure for uh, depending on like the industry that you're in. So that, that creates a new set of requirements for data retrieval. And the final, you know, kind of like a, an obvious observation, but the amount of data we have in the world is just growing. We just have more data than we ever did before. Um, so we want to be able to speed up, like we want to access the data, read and write to it quickly. So we have intermediate data layers now, like uh, key value stores, caches to help us retrieve, um, speed up data retrieval. So one of the first things that we did to try to meet these evolving needs was to try to scale vertically. And vertical scaling means to just add more compute power, more CPU, more memory, more whatever onto the machines that we already have. And this worked for a really, really long time. Um, however, at some point, unit economics kicks in, right? Like to increase your, uh, say like CPU by the first 50%, it's gonna be cheaper than the next 50% and the next 50%. So marginal, like the cost, that, that's, um, what is that called in economics? I, <laughs> this is really bad. I actually majored in economics, so I should remember the term for this. It's the opposite of diminishing marginal returns. But the last, um, at some point, that last 1% is going to be so, so prohibitively expensive, most companies won't want to pay for it. But let's say you have like super deep pockets. At some point, you actually hit the limits of hardware engineering. Um, and by that, of course, I mean Moore's law. <laughs> and this is, Moore's law is, is kind of like an economics law now, because it's less true today. But for 20, 25 years, it was true that every two years, the number of transistors on an integrated circuit chip would double, which in human language means that processing power doubles every two years. So if you were trying to expand your uh, compute capacity faster than Moore's law, then you couldn't buy a chip that could do what you wanted to do. I uh, drew my uh, kitten's growth in the first few years of his life to illustrate Moore's law. <laughs> uh, but that is also less true now, he's an adult cat. So lucky for us, in the early 2000s, uh, cloud computing hit the scene. Um, we all know Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud. These are the three giants that kind of compete with each other. There's some other players, like there's Alibaba Cloud, and Oracle Cloud, and a bunch of other smaller players out there now. Um, you also can run your own, a thing that looks like a cloud on your on-premises, if you already have the hardware. Uh, VMware, vSphere, Rackspace. <laughs> there's a couple other ones that are pretty popular. I don't know the names of all of them. Um, but this basically means the impact here is that it gives us an, the ability to now horizontally scale, which means that we don't need to worry about just adding more and more and more compute onto, you know, the machines that we have. We now can expand uh, seamlessly over multiple machines. So that change, that was a, that was a game changer at cloud computing, actually, um, because if you can make it trivial to horizontally scale and also to elastically scale, so you only request new machines when you need them. Um, there are good reasons why you might want to do this. One of the reasons is uh, scalability. Um, and that, that just means that you'll, you'll sometimes hit a circumstance where one machine can't handle the volume of data that you're trying to store because you have so much of it. Or like in, a, in more nuanced cases, actually, maybe you're processing huge requests and the requests themselves can't be processed by one machine. So you might split that request up and let multiple machines handle it. Um, this idea of like taking one chunk of data and partitioning it down to smaller chunks, by the way, is called uh, sharding or partitioning, lots of different names for it. Um, a real world example of sharding actually is encyclopedias, uh, because you'll notice that nobody publishes like one massive encyclopedia that's like 30 feet long. They'll chunk it down into um, volumes organized by first letter, and the first letter is the index, you can call it that way. Another reason why you might want to pursue horizontal distribution is availability. So if you can have more than one machine serving up the same data, it means that you build redundancy into your system. 
if one server goes down, it doesn't mean that all customer data is lost or all is unreachable. They have another, they have an alternative to connect to. And the final reason is latency, actually. So if you can store data, at the end of the day, when you make a request to you know, retrieve data from somewhere on the internet, uh, like an electric pulse has to travel a long wire for some length of time. So if you can store the end data closer to where your clients are requesting it from, it has to travel over a less fiber optic cable and the request times are gonna be faster. So there are more reasons on this, but these are the three key reasons that I wanted to highlight. So I wanna talk about modern distributed systems for a little while. Um, you may have heard the term shared nothing architecture. This is a term that I came across a lot when I was uh, doing my, my initial research, both for this talk and in, in my you know, like early forays into learning about distributed systems. So shared nothing architecture is the most popular form of network computing. Um, this is how all the public clouds work. What shared nothing means is uh, two machines, sorry, two instances never share fit, like access to exactly the same device drivers. So they're not accessing the same physical places in memory. Um, they don't share resources. So this is overall a very, very reasonable and sensible design. Um, it's better than the alternative, even if it makes life a little harder for lazy programmers like me who are just like, when I write Go, I'm just like, give me the pointers, it's fine. <laughs> That's a terrible way to write Go, don't write Go like that. Um, so it's so sensible that the idea of process-based memory isolation is directly baked into some programming languages. So in the Go programming language, Rob Pike, who's one of the main uh, language contributors, he has this really famous quote, don't communicate by sharing memory, share memory by communicating. Um, I don't know if Java has anything similar. I would assume that it does because Java is a sensible language. Um, but the idea here is that you never really want your processes to have to worry about low level things like device drivers and locations on disk or on memory. Um, that's just kind of setting yourself, like, you don't, like as, a, as a programmer, you don't want to manage things at that layer of abstraction anyway. Um, you're going to be in for a bad time. So let's zoom back out for a second and ask the question, what does it actually mean to run a distributed system? So today, like, it's, it's pretty clear to most tech-savvy audiences that building and operating a distributed system is a fundamentally different game than operating a system where everything is function calls on the same physical machine, the same host. Um, but that actually, that insight actually wasn't always obvious. And I think it's really curious that a lot of us have this intuition today, because 20 years ago, this is something that you had to like work really hard to, to grok and to understand. So one of the earliest discussions about how distributed computing is fundamentally different from local computing is this classic 1994 paper called A Note on Distributed Computing uh, by some people who worked at my, uh, Sun Microsystems. So this paper is a super cool read. It's, it's definitely a, um, I don't know, it's like, it's like opening up a time capsule. Because in 1994, nobody was building distributed systems, obviously at you know, Google scale, Netflix scale, like we see today. So a lot of people were just at the theoretical stage of trying to think about what, uh, you know, what the world would look like at the point where we do need to build these systems. A lot of people were, were hand-waving and being like, hey, it's okay, like by the time we need to do this, hardware engineers will figure it out for us. What they didn't take into account is that software engineering would then undo the gains made by hardware engineering, but that's okay. So this paper is really worth reading in its entirety. Um, I'll try to summarize the three main, like my, my three main takeaways for you here. So in the paper, they identify three main reasons that distributed computing is gonna be significantly harder than local computing. And those three reasons are latency, memory access, and partial failures. I would say that of these three, so latency definitely is something we still have to worry about. Um, we just, with, uh, with replication, um, with, repli uh, with having, being able to replicate data across multiple data centers and different geographies, we can mitigate the effects of, of poor network latency, but of course we can't get rid of it altogether. And I'll talk about latency a little bit later on in this talk too. Um, I would say that of these three, memory access is the one that hasn't really turned out to be such a showstopper because today, like we sort of settled on shared nothing architecture, sharing memory is not the way that processes communicate with each other. Um, so partial failures is still the big one. Um, that's the one I'm gonna spend a lot of time in this talk discussing. So according to Martin Klutman then, who he wrote a really, really good book called Designing Data Intensive Applications. And if you haven't read it before, I really recommend checking it out. It's in the O'Reilly catalog. Um, this is the one book that I would say like leveled me up the most. I was an app developer for years and years and I didn't know anything about the infrastructure side of things. So that's the one book that sort of bridged the gap for me in a very big way. Um, so Kletman says that distributed systems can be summarized like this. You have many machines, they're running a lot of different processes, 
and they only have message passing via unreliable networks that have variable delays and the system might suffer from partial failures, which is a really kind of a grim view of the world. It's like, what are computers? Do they, like, what are we doing? Do we know? I, I don't think we really know what we're doing. So distributed computing, really, really hard to reason about, um, super easy to make mistakes. And we've been making these mistakes for a long time. In, in the 90s, again, a group of people at Sun Microsystems, kind of seems like Sun was, you know, like the cutting edge of distributed computing research back in the 90s. Um, but some, a different, smart, a different group of really smart people came up with a list of eight fallacies of distributed computing. They actually originally had seven, and then James Gosling, who's the Java guy, added number eight in 1997. So uh, these fallacies kind of, I'll, I'll sort of like hand wave through this a little bit. Um, we know now that the network is not reliable. We know now that latency, of course, is not zero, can never be zero. Bandwidth is not infinite. Uh, network is not secure. <laughs> um, anyone who has ever set up an HTTPS domain should know a little bit about that. We know that topology changes over time, um, especially now with uh, different, you know, like different things, devices that we use to serve up traffic. Um, we know that there's, you can't assume that there's only one administrator. Transport costs are definitely not zero. And increasing like different connected devices, we have IoT devices, mobile devices. Um, we know that networks are not homogenous. So I'm going to zoom in a lot on number one, which is that the network is reliable. So at some point, I <laughs> put like a brief diversion here because this is a lot of uh, sort of like academic and historical context to drop on conference audiences. So I think I'm going to take a pause here and say like and acknowledge that it might seem at this point that we're fencing off a lot of things that are not true. Like I'm telling you, you can't trust this. You can't believe that. You can't think this. But how can we know what is true about the world? Like this is kind of the feeling that a lot of people get when they start digging into distributed systems. There's this frustration that like, okay, I can't trust anything to be true about the world anymore. Which reminded me a lot of me, like my third year in undergrad, um, I took a philosophy class called epistemology. And I never ever thought that my philosophy degree would be relevant in a tech talk, but here we are. Um, epistemology is the philosophy of knowledge. It is a field of philosophy that asks the question, how can we really be sure about the things that we think we know? So within epistemic philosophy, we have two main schools. We have foundationalism, which says that there exists fundamental truths about the universe on which everything else is built, kind of like how there are first principles in mathematics. So the first principles in mathematics, you actually can't prove but they have to be true, otherwise all of mathematics falls down. So this is a similar principle. But then we have coherentism on the other side, which is kind of like the opposite. Coherentism says that nothing is absolutely true on its own, just like one matchstick can't stand on its own. But once we have enough other supporting truths about the world, they sort of interlock and logically reinforce each other. And that's how we can know that things are probably true, or they're true enough, they're good enough for us. So within distributed systems reasoning, whichever school you subscribe to, uh, it's a really big task to start to define either your foundational truths or your interlocking truths. And of course, like there are people that say within epistemology and elsewhere on the internet, what if we're just brains and bats and nothing is real about our worldview? By the way, uh, the skeptics are the ancestors of trolls on Twitter. That's something that you won't find in a footnote. Um, and on top of that, like unreliable message delivery to sort of uh, loop back to the Kleppmann quote. Um, where he talks a little bit about unreliable message delivery. Like this is a big, big problem in distributed systems reasoning. Um, the classic case is the Byzantine generals problem, sometimes called like the two generals problem. There's a bunch of different names for this. So the scenario goes like this. Imagine you have two generals and they're trying to coordinate a war for some reason, but they can't directly reach each other. So they have to send this little messenger guy who is kind of an unreliable little dude. So in the end, the, you know, the messenger, in the in the scenario, he's sentient and he can make decisions. Like in distributed systems, there isn't a decision maker in the middle, so that's where the analogy falls flat a little bit. But the impact here is that neither of the generals can really verify whether the message relayed was from the other general or accurate or in its original form. So this concept happens all the time in distributed systems because uh, messages get dropped, messages get corrupted. If you're not using good security, like if you're not using in-flight and at-rest encryption, your messages can get uh, tampered with and uh, swapped out or intercepted. Um, so we have some, some tools, like we can use HTTPS, we can use uh, hosting verification to check um, sender addresses and things like that. But we do always, always, always have to be thinking about spoofing, about tampering, about attacks, uh, unexpected um, 
the messages can just get corrupted in flight. Um, when I worked at Pivotal, I was on a support case for a while where in the end we kind of like concluded that a client's load balancer was probably truncating the length of messages that RabbitMQ, um, RabbitMQ needed the entire uh, payload to be able to put messages back together in the right order. So they were like, my messages are arriving out of order. This is weird. Um, so we were like, well, <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. Your load balancer is doing weird things and that's, that's not a RabbitMQ problem. So like unexpected things happen in flight all the time. So of course, like we can mitigate a lot of these problems by monitoring, observing, tracing distributed systems properly. Um, this isn't a talk about any of those topics. I wouldn't be able to do justice to those topics in like 35 minutes. So I'm gonna keep going. If you wanna talk about this afterwards, we can. So there are a lot of things that we are just never gonna be able to know. But I think that we can know one thing <laughs> when it comes to distributed systems operability or operating. We can know that shit's just gonna fail. And honestly, you'll be a lot better off if you just assume that things are gonna fail and start engineering for failure rather than hoping that things are resilient. Which brings us to the next chapter of this talk, which is the CAP theorem. If you haven't heard of the CAP theorem before, don't worry about it. This is meant to be a 101 kind of ramp up. Um, so the CAP theorem dropped in the year 2000, like a mixtape when Dr. Eric Brewer gave a keynote talk at the Principles of Computing Conference. So it's been around for a little while. And sometimes on the internet, you'll see people, I kind of straw man this a little bit, I know. Um, people kind of formulate the CAP theorem as here are three things, you can choose two of them. Which means that you can, uh, they mean to suggest that you can design a distributed system so that you can trade off consistency, availability, or partition tolerance. Uh, you can get rid of one in favor of the other and keep the other two. But that actually is not possible. Like that's an incorrect way of thinking about the CAP theorem. Um, because first of all, like today, there are a lot of alternative frameworks to CAP. It's not the only framework out there anymore. But the reason why is because you can't sacrifice partition tolerance. Um, for reasons that I'm gonna talk a lot about in a minute, when you have the distributed system, even if there are two processes running within one data center or within one physical host, there, you're never gonna have 100% immunity to network partitions. Um, literally the only way you could 100% get rid of network partitions is to run a database or to run a system with only one node, at which point it's not definitionally a distributed system anymore. And Brewer himself acknowledges this. Uh, in, 12, in 2012, he released a paper where he acknowledges like, as some, research, as some researchers point out, exactly what it means to forfeit P partition tolerance is unclear. So let's go through each of these letters one by one and explore them a little bit more deeply. So C, is for the part why I troll conference audiences. C is for linearizability. It's funny because it doesn't begin with C. Um, so the reason why I don't say C is for consistency is because uh, I, I want to talk about different like definitions of the word consistency. So linearizability is a super narrow definition and it means a very strong form of consistency. So linearizability means this. Um, you have two operations that change the world, which occur at time zero and time one, where zero is before one. Um, in the literature, you'll see the word register used to describe this. You'll say, they'll say like, oh, a register change happened, or like you change an entry in a register. Well, that basically, you can imagine that as saying like, uh, they've changed one row in a database table. Like it's, it's a entry that can only have one state at one given point in time. So it's not like an append only database or anything like that. Um, so if you have an operation that changes the register, it flips the cat state from hungry into being full. If any client saw that the cat is full, from that point forward, um, so any, like, what once someone sees it's full, can't say that it's hungry to anybody anymore. So this sounds kind of, it sounds kind of simple, like trivially simple, but actually it's really, really hard. Uh, because this basically demands instant and universal replication, right, to every single client of the world. That's really, really hard. Um, and that's actually kind of impossible, because replication lag can't be zero. Um, you remember what I said earlier about you still need, like, a small amount of time for electric pulses to travel along cables. Like, you're kind of upper bounded, lower bounded, rather, by the speed of light. So, Replication lag can't be zero, but of course, like database engineers, really, really smart people who are working on you know, like MySQL and what have you out there, they spend a lot of time trying to get as close as possible, but there are other trade-offs that get made along the way. And also eventual consistency doesn't count. Um, eventual consistency, 
is not part of the CAPS, CAP form's original formulation. Um, there are a lot of different ways to define consistency. So if you've ever read Kyle Kingsbury's blog, um, he blogs a lot about distributed computing at jepson.io. This is a really fantastic and kind of mind boggling blog post about all the different logical definitions or all the different definitions of consistency and what each of them logically implies. So the next time your boss, your you know, lead architect or whatever says, we need high, like highly consistent data, partition, you can like show them this diagram and be like, okay, which one of these? <laughs> I think I would actually cry if someone did that to me. Um, but the takeaway here is like, consistency is not a binary state. Um, there are a lot of different subtle definitions of it. So we just have to be really careful about which one we mean because each of them implies different design constraints. So the next letter of CAP is A, which means availability. I'm not going to trick you anymore. Um, a is for availability, which, uh, which also is another tricky one because we tend to think of things as being available or not. Um, but again, similar to linear, uh, similar to consistency, availability is also not a binary state. Things are a lot messier in reality because of network latency. Network latency didn't really make it into the original formulation of CAP either. So, but that's like, that has really important impacts for reasoning about um, availability because how can we really know if a node is being unresponsive or just slow, right? So uh, the example, the kind of like dumb example that I keep using here is like, imagine you have a friend who's like chronically late to everything. And maybe like the first few times you wait for the friend and you're like, we'll give her five minutes. But after a certain point, you gotta make a decision of whether you keep waiting or you, you, know, you go do your plans and move on with your life. Um, and like people who design databases or design systems like kind of have to make the same decision with um, with responses from other members of the node rather than, than like friends and social engagements. So what you can do is you can set a timeout, right? Um, determining what constitutes a reasonable timeout though is also kind of a dark art. The first time you set up a new system, you actually don't know what normal looks like. So you might as well just be like, all right, five seconds sounds good. <laughs> that's what a lot of people are just like, oh, I don't know. But let's pick a number and that's our SLO from now on. Like, I don't know, it's, it's, not, it's not a hard science. You have to live and learn. Um, some tools, uh, I've heard that some databases have built in learning now, but I'm not 100% sure which one. So uh, don't quote me on that. So the final letter for CAP, of course, is P, which stands for partition tolerance. It's kind of the issue that we've all been, that you know, I've been dancing around this whole time. Um, just like some language clarification here, a partition in this case refers to a network partition, also called a net, uh, network fault, net split. There's a couple other names from it, but basically what it means is when connectivity between two things hosting nodes in your system gets, gets cut off, um, connectivity gets interrupted. So during a partition event, your nodes might as well be on um, opposite ends of a wormhole. I don't know if anyone's ever played the game Portal, but like you can't you know, communicate outside of the, uh, outside of the wormhole. Um, actually, that's not true in Portal. Take that back, <laughs> undo. So, but the point is here that um, during a partition, your nodes, like, you actually can't know what's happening on the other side. So you don't know if the other side is still processing client requests. You don't know if it's responding to health checks, um, uh, short of you, like, pulling your health check service, I guess. But you don't know if the other side is alive or dead. That's the point here. So a quick recap. Uh, C is for consistency. A is for availability. P is for partition tolerance. And I want to close off the section by... Um, kind of like doing an intuitive proof for the cap theorem. It's not like a rigorous mathematical proof or anything, but um, understanding the cap theorem is actually quite, it's not that hard, which is, I was, I was surprised by this early on in my learning about this, um, but let's like walk through it together. So imagine a partition event happens and uh, the, the big cats in this diagram are your server nodes and the smaller cats are your clients. Um, so by the way, <laughs> this diagram is kind of bad because you should never have a, a database system with two nodes because two nodes can't uh, achieve a simple majority between if they disagree you can't tell who's right or not you should always have three or at least an odd number but for this example it was easier to draw two so imagine you have a split the two server nodes get disconnected um, they're on opposite sides of a wormhole they don't know what the other side is doing so as a as a systems architect you actually have only two options two logical options for what to do right now either you can let the clients continue to read and write on both sides of the split, which necessarily results in the loss of linearizability. Because imagine that one of the green clients writes something and the pink client will never be able to read that. So, that, so that, that's gone. Option two, as a systems architect here, is you can stop writes on one side of the partition until the event stops. 
But that sacrifices availability for all the clients that happen to be on the wrong side of the split at the time that the partition happens. And the reason why I made the comment about like, you should have three, you should have an odd number earlier is because usually like databases that use um, the sort of like pause minority option, the, in RabbitMQ, this is called pause minority. I think that term might be used in other databases as well. Usually the side of the split that has fewer members on it is the one that gets paused. Um, just like probabilistically, we wanna keep more, we wanna try to keep more data online. So we're gonna finish by zooming in a little bit more on partition tolerance and exploring what that really means. So I just want to head off the section by saying that network partitions are inevitable. And I think I've said this a few times already. Uh, so even if we look at, you know, like Google is probably one of the um, companies that has like the most knowledgeable distributed systems experts in the world right now. Uh, and even Google, of course, like GCP um, experiences network partitions. So Jeff Dean wrote a couple years back that in the first year of a Google cluster's life, it experiences five rack failures, three router failures, tons and tons of other problems. Um, so any given rack is going to go through, you know, like it's going to have connectivity problems, availability problems, even if it's brand new hardware. And the reason for that is because hardware will just fail. That's one set of the reasons. So for example, the hardware holding together your routers could just mysteriously fail. I don't know if anyone else on this call is a cat owner, but my cat loves to uh, pull cables out from devices. Um, but network cables are also going to eventually give out the stuff holding together boxes. Uh, apparently sometimes, so this is a kind of larger scale, but um, a few years ago, sharks would mistake undersea cables, transatlantic, um, the fiber optic cables for fish, and they would decide <laughs> they would try to chew on them, which actually did cause some intercontinental outages a couple of times. But don't worry, because Ars Technica journalists want you to know that as of 2015, sharks are no longer a threat to subsea internet cables. The reason is because Google and Facebook lay those cables now and they wrap them in Kevlar, um, which the fact that Google and Facebook lay our intercontinental cables is something we might want to be worried about. But that's a different talk. So software also behaves weirdly. Um, hopefully, as anyone who's written software will know, sometimes the code we write does things other than what we intended to do. And sometimes those things result in um, activities that look like network, uh, network partitions. Um, so in multi-tenant servers, which is almost always, this is generally how public clouds work, your resource isolation is never going to be 100% static, um, and you don't want it to because it's not efficient, and there's other reasons why. So sometimes VMs or containers will burst, which means they'll briefly spike in, say, CPU usage or memory usage or whatever, whatever the burstiness settings you've put on. So if your database node happens to be running somewhere else on the same machine, you could see some resources get temporarily throttled which this is generally called the noisy neighbor problem in distributed computing. This is a hard one to solve. But also sometimes garbage collection randomly happens, right? Like, I don't know how it works in Java, but Golang for many, many years had stopped the world garbage collection. They possibly still do. So if one of your database nodes runs a Golang application, then that could look, that could look awkward for when that's happening. Um, network glitches randomly happen. Uh, this is not really an illustration. It's just a character glitch from wreck -It Ralph drawn as a cat, which is a great movie. Ralph Breaks the Internet um, is kind of accurate in terms of showing kids how the internet works. I love it. Also, sometimes people do bad things, right? This is less about software, more about the, so the social part of things, which I'm going to, that's going to be the last part of this talk. So in 2009, someone apparently crawled into a manhole in Southern California and decided to take an axe to some fiber optic cables. So people there had a network partition for a little while. That was sad. So I hope you're convinced either by this talk or by your own experiences now that distributed systems reasoning, architecting, building, maintaining is really, really hard. Um, so I follow Peter Alvaro on Twitter because he's hilarious. He's a professor uh, somewhere in California. I forget where. He asks his students to think about, OK, what is the, hard, the one hard thing about distributed systems if you had to pick one word? One student says, uncertainty. And Peter's like, yes, OK, that's great. But then another student says, Docker. And then Peter, the student's like, actually, that's better. Take mine off. So, all right, talk over. We can all go home. No, but in all seriousness, like, why does any of this matter, right? So the practical reality is that we can't guarantee that every node in a system is always going to be alive and reachable. Uh, so that means that every part, some part of every distributed system, every system that the system that you are running today is always at some risk of failure. So think about how hard it is to like coordinate social plans. Again, this analogy with a friend who's always having bad luck, right? So all of this points to 
the Fisher-Lynch-Patterson correctness result, which is the outcome of a very, very famous landmark paper from 1985, which basically, this is like the super, this is like Blinkist for Blinkist, like the super, super condensed version is that distributed consensus is impossible to guarantee when at least one process might fail. There's a lot here to unpack truthfully, um, but that would be, th that deserves like a full length talk in its own. Um, I'll send some resources along afterwards. I think there might be some already listed on my website for this talk. But as we've just seen, in almost every case of running a distributed system today, there's at least one element out of your control, which presents the possibility for failure. So the good news is we don't have to just sit with that failure. We've been thinking about this failure for, for a long time now. Um, we have some mitigation strategies, both technical and social. Um, so one set of technical mitigation strategies is instead of waiting for everyone to say yes, we can just make some rules for how many people have to say yes, how many nodes have to agree uh, before we can proceed with a write, with a, with a um, serving a request, whatever it is. So that's a bit oversimplified, but broadly uh, making rule sets about what's enough to proceed is uh, like that whole field is called consensus algorithms. Um, Raft is one of the most popular consensus algorithms out there because it's easy to understand. It's a lot easier to understand than Paxos. Um, it's one of many what we call two-phase commit strategies that try to keep a simple majority of nodes in agreement about what is the latest data. Um, some of them use further patterns like leader follower inside of them, so they actually restrict who can write, which is another chaos mitigation strategy. Um, also, something I like to tell people about Raft is, did you know that Raft doesn't stand for anything? There is an acronym if you Google it, but it's a backronym. It was applied after the fact. It's called Raft because it's a series of logs. So that's your fun fact for the day. Um, so what's even harder than getting machines to agree? We've had Raft, Paxos, whatever. We have, we, we've had these things for a long time. But the more interesting question I think to ask is, um, it's even harder to get machines. It's harder than getting machines to agree is getting humans to agree. It's getting get humans to work together and uh, recognize that they are also part of the system. Like humans are a source and also a response to complexity. So I wanna spend the last part of this talk talking about the, um, I've sort of like used the term socio-technical systems a little bit maybe, but I wanna hone in on the socio part of that. So I wanna say here that the more fault tolerant we make our systems, the more inherent complexity they pick up, right? Imagine you're designing a system you just want these two clients to be able to communicate with each other whatever right you just like give them each other's addresses and ports and you're off to the races then like someone might say okay well we want to accommodate for failures and errors like we if one of them goes offline we still want the message to be delivered later on we want retries so people will reach for things like messaging queues um, and then later on we might reach for load balances because you're like, oh like one side of the one of these um, size gets a lot more traffic than the others. Like we need to have multiple copies of that. So we introduce load balancers like HA proxy maybe. And then maybe we start introducing container orchestrators because we're like, it's no good to roll your own. Let's just use Kubernetes. That'll solve all of our problems. Um, so like this is not, not like a poo-poo on Kubernetes or anything like that. The point I'm trying to make here is that in, sometimes, you know, sometimes you do need this complexity and it, that's, that's what inherent complexity is as opposed to incidental complexity. Um, but of course, like, it's not a bad thing. In a lot of cases, you do need you do need these things. But the point here is that we need to think about what the trade-offs are for the humans that are monitoring, uh, not just monitoring, that's like the, the smallest part, the humans that are designing, building, and maintaining these systems. So to revisit an idea from earlier in this talk, uh, Charity Majors, who runs an observability company, um, so she works with lots and lots of data on a, break, on a daily basis, she speaks about this growing complexity quite often. So systems today are growing increasingly complicated, mental models are getting harder to build, and it's harder for us humans to reason about what's actually going on underneath. So the question I wanna you know, kind of ask here is like, how do we manage this growing complexity? Well, I think the first thing we need to do is, we need to spend some time understanding where cognitive complexity comes from. So a lot of people in resilience engineering uh, talk about the Woods theorem, which um, Dr. David Woods uh, sort of coined at um, in the paper Coping with Complexity uh, back in 1998. So the Woods theorem states that as the complexity of a system increases, the accuracy of any single agent's own model of that system decreases rapidly, which is like, that's super depressing, right? You're like, oh man, if I just put a rabbit MQ, my, my mental model is going to be worse. Like, I, I don't know. 
um, maybe maybe that's not the way to interpret it, but the way that I've always thought about building mental models is like, well, we think that we learn like this, right? So we when we join a new team or start working on a new project, we think that what we do is like, all right, I got this new piece of information, I'm going to build the nodes to my existing pieces of information, and I'm going to stack this new knowledge neatly on top of my existing knowledge. But that's really not how it works. Um, in reality, we, you know, as humans, we don't have time or resources to absorb the new information. But more often, I think what happens is the context that we're building on top of shifts from underneath us because of technological innovations, because of things that assumptions that we didn't know we held that later turn out to be not true. So more often than not, we're just trying our best to hang on to a few relevant bits, right? Because like computers, we are very, very much constrained by what I call like the size of our level one caches. So the question we're trying to ask them, we're building complex system as teams is, how can we achieve consensus in terms of our understandings of the world? How can we make sure that those same few cards that we're holding onto within like each team member is holding onto are close enough in similarity to the cards that everybody else is holding onto so that we can be on the same page when we talk about our systems and we talk about like inherent risk, complexity trade-offs and these things. So when you, when you don't have common language, um, imagine you tell three engineers, like, we're going to have fish for dinner, and they all picture very different things, right? Or you ask them, like, what does our system look like? What would it look like to build on top of this? Um, the systems we build and run today are really complex. Uh, the best that we can do, I think, is to try to tease out some relevant pieces of information by looking for situations that are information-rich proxies. And actually, like, if you just tell, you ask someone, like, what's your mental model? <laughs> like, uh, people, most people don't really know how to answer that question. And I think it's difficult to talk about. Um, so incident analysis is something that John Allspaw and his teams have been looking at for a long, long time, because when you get into the failure domain, that's a clear indication that the assumptions about what needs to, about what holds your systems together, like those, at least one of those assumptions was wrong. So that means that that's a good time to flush out the things that were previously unspoken about mental models. Um, so usually what happens if you haven't been in a production incident before, teams will conduct an incident review. Sometimes they'll call it a post-mortem, which makes me sad because I'm like, who died? <laughs> um, but after a production outage. Uh, so incidents are actually opportunities for fresh conversations and fresh learnings. So if you want to learn more about this, I recommend that you seek out uh, some of John Oswald's research. Um, there's a good report called the Stella Report. I think it's just called Stella Report com or something uh, there's a link to it later um so the question of course is like how does incident analysis tease out mental models so during an incident review there are usually a couple of activities that teams commonly do so you might construct a timeline you might uh, create architectural diagrams to try to pinpoint where you know like where patient zero was for the for the failure um doesn't really matter what activity you choose just make sure that everyone understands what's expected of them so the goal of an incident review is to create an environment where the team can learn from the incident. The one non-negotiable element of, of creating these types of environments, of course, is to make sure that the conversations themselves are blameless. Um, and by that, I mean like having a blameless conversation means that you focus on learning and surfacing information rather than the assignment of blame, <laughs> rather than justice. And I think that by having these conversations, most teams will discover that every single person involved in the deployment process, in the incident recovery process, had a different worldview of what they thought was happening. So in the moments you know, before and after the outage happened. In other words, like people had different mental models. So just to close down this talk on blameless postmortems, I think like one really clear litmus test of whether your incident review conversations are actually blameless is to listen very carefully for counterfactual statements. Um, counterfactuals are statements like, well, had Denise not deployed on a Friday, then Will would not have been paged on at Saturday like at 2 a.m. Like there are statements that follow the form of had this ha happened, then this other thing would or would not have happened. So counterfactuals are really difficult because they're hypothetical, first of all. And second of all, they're not really productive, right? Because so what if you establish that a different course of events could have happened for the better? The reality is that they didn't, and you can't actionably, you can't act on them. So here's the thing, this is like the dumbest slide. Human decisions never occur in a vacuum. I drew this for the <laughs> London audience at QCon. So the question, like the real interesting question to ask if you're in uh, any kind of like retrospective format meeting, incident response meetings, I think, or incident review meetings, I think are a, sub, are a, a subcategory of retrospectives. Um, but to ask the question, what seemed reasonable at the time is a really interesting angle of exploration, I think. 
So in addition to running your incident reviews in a blameless manner, um, the final thing here is like, of course, don't accept human error as a root cause. Uh, I sometimes see teams be like, oh, well, this person messed up <laughs> and that was what caused the incident and like the end, go home. I was like, well, no. Um, first of all, that, that person's gonna feel terrible. And second of all, you haven't finished your investigation if you stop with human error, right? Because there was so much more interesting knowledge to unearth. There was so much more that you could have learned from this. So you could have learned, for example, if a user or an operator was misled by design that was really unintuitive. Like, what tools are you using to monitor your systems? Um, does everyone know how to use those tools? Does everyone know what all the bells and whistles do? Do they know what the danger buttons to not click are? Um, other things are that I see really, really commonly in SRE teams is like, are you alerting all the things? Like if you have 30 alerts flowing in a day and everyone's just like, okay, cancel, cancel, like snoozing all of them, what use are those alerts? Alert fatigue is a real thing, by the way, not just in, not just in incident response in software, but like in every industry that deals with crisis management, like emergency response. And the final thing is like, maybe we fail to understand the assumptions that our users would bring into the control room with them. And those users might be your own operators. So these are all sort of missed opportunities if you just say it was human error. So in fact, if you start reading into some of the latest thinking around resilience engineering, there are some folks like mostly folks over at Netflix suggesting that maybe there are no root causes, right? A lot of incident reviews try to dive down and they like to wrap up a review report with like, oh, the root cause is this, we're just never gonna do this again. So there's more, um, this idea of there being no root cause is explored much more deeply by Ryan Kitchens. Uh, he gave a talk a few years ago at SRECon. I've linked the talk in the, in the resources for this talk. So I kind of was only half joking about epistemology, um, like how do we think we know what we know, but in all seriousness, like we all have different frames of reference and humans don't have great vocabulary to figure out the differences. So humans can make mistakes, of course, of course we all know that, but in addition to being able to make mistakes, like we recover and learn a lot faster than machines. So the more that we push, we depend on technology and push it to its limits, I think the more we're going to need highly skilled, highly trained and well-practiced people to make these systems resilient because people are going to act as the last line of defense against the failures that will inevitably occur. This is, a, this is from a paper by, um, by, I'm not gonna read all the names out loud, but from 2012 about the ironies of automation. So oftentimes like teams reach for automation to make sure that something never ever happens again, right? But like designing automation itself is like, that's not gonna, that's not gonna will away. That's not gonna solve for the fact that humans are part of the system. You can't automate decision-making necessarily. Like things that require higher order thinking, like abstract reasoning, you can't automate. So we borrow against inherent complexity every day. We decide to make our systems more clever, more structured, more automated even. But as humans, we can learn and adapt. That's the good news in all of this. So we should be constantly challenging ourselves to empathize with every person, like every human, in part of, in our socio our socio technical systems, every operator, every developer, um, every uh, what are, what else are there? Every sysadmin, every end user, of course, every stakeholder. So, when we think about design choices, and of course, like I have this opinion that every decision is a design decision, but you might not share that opinion. Um, but our design choices should ultimately be made in a way that they make life simpler for the humans that are operating and using our systems. Because we owe it to our end users and our teams to understand and to design for the whole system, including the human parts. Uh, thanks so much, everyone. Uh, my slides and references are here, and I have about uh, 10 or 15 minutes if you have any questions. Thanks for your time. Great, thanks, thanks, Denise. Um, okay, so um, that was a that was a that was a really nice talk. Actually, my my seven year old daughter was also listening, and she enjoyed that too. So <laughs> it's always a good sign. Um, so I've actually got one um, question, uh, which is, uh, what are some of the strategies you use to mitigate some of these distributed um, systems problems? And what are the easiest and cheapest to maintain to, to implement as a developer? You know, what are the go to things that you always do, no matter what? I would say like one of the easiest ways to avoid introducing too much inherent complexity is to just pick the path well, uh, what's that Robert Frost film, like the path more taken, um, whatever other people are already using, like choose those technologies. Like if you need to build search, just use Elasticsearch. Don't like build your own 
you know, like crazy wrapper over Lucene and your own custom whatevers. Um, choose the path more, more paved because other people will have run into the problems before you and there will usually be a community of practice around using those tools. Um, also, like the most popular databases out there. So people sometimes ask me like, oh, should I use like, I don't know, like Mongo or like CouchDB or Cockroach or like MySQL or Post and I'm like Postgres or MySQL. Like always just choose one of those two if you're building a new system because they have been around for so, so long and they have all the uh, sort of like partition recovery things already built in. Um, other people have already run into these problems. So if you don't truly need to reinvent the wheel, um, use the tools that are most popular because they already have these mitigation strategies built into them. Like you can, there's literally like a flag in MySQL. You can just tell it to use like raft or something. I don't know if that super answers the question. Yeah, I think it does. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, we have uh, one more question from um, Muzamil. Um, he hasn't. Yeah. Do you have a question? Uh, well, yes. Yeah. Um... Well, when you were talking about CAP theorem, uh, then I was wondering that if we replace C with the eventual sense of tensors. So is it possible that we can guarantee all three attributes? And that, that means eventual consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. We can't have with consistency that understood. But what if, if we just replace it with eventual consistency that eventually the system will be consistent and we will have only three attributes yeah so i think the point of cap is not to, it's not like a design goal to have all three i don't think that was ever brewer's intention um and even like i haven't read the spanner paper from beginning to finish but i've i've heard like if you if you want to um the best example of someone like conquering the cap theorem or proving it uh you know that you can have all three kind of um, even with the original formulation, linearizability, uh, the Spanner paper written by the Google um, scientists and engineers who built that is probably the best place to start digging into that. Um, I haven't thought long and hard about what would it, what would CAP look like if we allowed eventual consistency, but I think like it wouldn't really be the point of having CAP as an analytical tool. Like it's only useful as a tool because it forces you to think about trade-offs, right? Sorry, that's kind of my like non-response response. Okay, thank you. Cool, okay. Um, I can't see there being any more questions. So unless someone wants to ask something quickly, no, I don't think there's anything else. So yeah, I, th I think that's it. We'll, we'll, we'll um, leave you to it. Thank you so much, Denise, for your, for your time and, and uh, and and sharing your, your knowledge with us um that was really great and um yeah thanks everyone for joining yeah thanks so much for having me have a good yeah. rest of your day My pleasure thanks thanks very much denise take care everyone thanks